Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. So many guys, welcome back to another show and look, really, really excited about this week's guest, uh, Russell Martin, who's the head coach of Swansea City in the championship. Uh, I've been speaking to Russell for over about a year now. I first met him when we presented on a conference together. And uh, yeah, he looked, he's one of the best young English coaches around. Unbelievable uh, what he did at first, the MK Dons, making him one of the best possession teams in the whole of Europe. I think his stats were only just behind Barcelona and Man City in terms of possession. Uh, unbelievable achievement uh, in League One and playing some great football, entertaining the fans. Obviously, they're now moving to Swansea. Uh, Swansea City last year beginning of the season so really interesting to chat uh, really trying to get into it and find out really how he does that what does he do on the training pitch to really develop that quality and uh, the, to try and dominate the ball to then dominate the game and uh, yes yeah, so I look really thrilled that he agreed to come on the show and uh, this is one really we have to is not going to disappoint and remember the My Personal Football Coach Level 2 e-learning course is out and there is a 20% discount code Level 2 podcast uh, check out in the description and uh, yeah like I say there's the only course in the world where we uh, break down 1v1 tactics what they look like in and around the pitch and how to coach them importantly looking at the core skills at the highest level again how to coach them what are the, some of the uh, the misconceptions and some of the similar errors people fall into when I only are doing the skills and also coaching them and also lots of session design, how to design ball mastery in 1v1 sessions and lots of exclusive sessions as well. So like I say, nothing like it in the world. Really proud of this one, actually. Really important work. A little bit different from the first course, which is more like a presentation. This is a uh, six hours of uh, actual live recorded video footage of me presenting and of sessions as well. So like I say, check it out. Uh, Level 2 podcast is the 20% discount code. But without further ado, let's get into the show. Russell Martin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, can you give us a brief uh, history of your playing and coaching journey up to this point, please? Yeah, um, so I, started, I came from non-league. I was at a team called Lewis down in Sussex. Um, I've been from Brighton. It's, it wasn't far from my house. So um, signed for Wickham at 18. I wrote to every league club in the country and got three replies. One was Swansea, actually. One was Bristol Rovers and one was Wickham. And um, the other two were too far away. So I went to Wickham, ended up there four years, uh, loved it. Went to Peterborough from there, um, got promoted to League One. We had a really good so the championship, sorry, from League One. We had a really good team. Um, then left there to go to Norwich and, and reconnect with Paul Lambert, who I'd had at Wickham and spent nearly 10 years at Norwich, obviously, all the way to the Premier League from League One, relegated again, then back promoted to the Premier League and then relegated back to the Championship. I then went to Rangers for six months just before I left Norwich on loan, which was a brilliant experience. Um, the club was in a really different place to what it is now, but it was, I learned so much there. Um, it's better to prepare me for, for this job, certainly. Um, and then had a short spell at Warsaw for eight weeks. Just didn't fit um, my family's lifestyle at the time very well. Um, and then uh, went to MK Dons and, and finished playing there for... Two years near enough, I think, maybe 18 months and then got the manager's job and now three years into management nearly. And um, yeah, I feel like I've aged about 10. <laughs> yeah. um, just tell us a bit about that. How did that transition come about then from, from, from uh, player to manager? And tell us a little bit about that and, and practice. What was that like? What were the main you know, challenges in that? Yeah, so it was, um, it was interesting. It was unexpected. And um, it, I went from obviously one day, the Saturday evening being the player, to the, by the Sunday morning, I was the manager. So it changed the dynamic completely between myself and my teammates who I've been sharing a dressing room with. I tried to be really uh, normal and be the same, but obviously the dynamic shifted. So when people come into my office and uh, speaking to me, we'd been teammates in the dressing room. And then all of a sudden I was, I was in charge of their picking the team and they see the manager as being the one, you know, who's in charge of their destiny almost, which isn't isn't right, but that's sometimes how, how they look at it because you're the guy that picks the team and um, seeing the vulnerability of some of them you didn't see when you're a teammate in the dressing was just, it was incredibly eye-opening. Um, and I learned a lot in a really short space of time. So I'm, I'm forever grateful to Pete Winkleman for giving me, to Pete Winkleman for giving me that opportunity. He obviously has a history of, um, you know, going for young managers and first-time managers. And um, I'm really grateful for that. And I think my relationships with the staff at the club 
got me the job because obviously um, when Paul Tisdale um, got sacked, Pete had asked all the all the staff around the club who, what, he, what they thought he should do. And um, thankfully for me, I had a good relationship with a lot of people and, and they said that they think, you know, I deserve an opportunity and would be ready. So really grateful and spent nearly two years there and um, obviously left a really difficult time when we came here to Swansea after we're four days before the start of the season, really. So we just finished pre-season at MK and um, came here. So a really difficult time and it wasn't ideal for anyone, but um, I'm really grateful and I loved my time. MK and learned so much. So the things I took from it really going from player to manager were um, you had to, I had to be myself and, and we had to, we started with a vision of a team that we wanted in terms of trying to dominate the ball and doing what we really believed in, but we were in the relegation zone and I was really fortunate that Pete, um, the chairman at MK, basically said, you know, I don't care if we get relegated, I just want an identity back at the club, bringing something back that we can then take forward. And so it took the pressure off massively really early on. Um, and we did enough to stay up in a COVID hit season where it's points per game. So we finished outside of the relegation zone and then we went from, um, we, we, we gradually and slowly improved from there. So that's about then that, that identity you talked about. How did that come about? I mean, you've got a very, you know, unique, well, footballing philosophy, particularly in, in you know, the, the lower divisions. How did, how did you mould that? How did that come about? Was that through experiences of playing for other coaches or seeing football, other football? What was that? that process like well, I think it's um I think it's the the vision of the team I would have loved to have played in I think so um if I look back was lucky to play in some teams that dominated the ball but obviously no one as much as we have done uh, MK and, and at Swansea but um I was a player who really enjoyed having the ball and wanted to dominate the ball more throughout my career and would have loved to have done it a bit more um and then, yeah, where did it come from? I think the teams you watch, enjoy watching play was like the the most enjoyable football for me to watch was obviously Barcelona under under Pep Guardiola and then what he's done at Man City and um, seeing managers who like to to play that way and, and dominate the ball. Um, so, yeah, I think you look at stuff. I think any coach takes stuff from other people and you look at it and put your own spin on it. Um and then it was, you know, we had, we had a really good team at um, MK of staff and people that believed in it. And I worked with a fantastic coach, Luke Williams, who's a Notts County manager now, who'd, who'd had experience of trying to play that style of football in uh, lower leagues. We did it a bit differently to, to how we did it at um, Swindon. So we added our own spin to things. But um, we were really fortunate. I was really fortunate. I had a lot of people who really believed in, in that in the style and identity and myself um, they believed in myself from from really early on so it gave us the license to try it really and just learn all the, all the time what we could do um, and what we're willing to compromise on and be flexible with because I think my belief is you start with a like a utopia the utopic vision of the of the team and then um, try and get there <laughs> whichever way you can and, and and see what you're willing to be flexible with um, but there has to be a certain few things, foundations that you just can't compromise on to get there. And that's certainly um, in my my take on it. And also, like, there's some really, really, really good players in lower league football. To even get to that point, they've survived a hell of a lot in terms of you think how many players are out there to get to just to get to the first league football in the EFL is um, takes incredible uh, resilience, talent, um Courage, and then a lot of the time they get there and and they they can't express themselves and they just survive. And um, I think it was trying to put a team out there that was fearless, really, or accepted the fear and just sort of embraced it and went. Actually, I've got nothing to lose, and we'll give it a go. And I've been really fortunate at MK. We had a group of players who were willing to take it on, and um, really, really lucky that Swansea that it'd been the same because that was, I think was the biggest sort of question for us when we came here was can we. Um, is there going to be too much ego for us to try this stuff? And is there going to be too much fear and scar tissue on some of the players that um, have never played this way before, but they've been incredible with the way they've taken it on. And what about, uh, we have a mutual friend, Max Aarons, obviously I've, I've known for many, many years and worked with, and he's speaking very highly of you and your time, but you see reflecting on the time you were speaking about coaching at the highest level. And you said to, to work at the really highest level, you have to play football that sort of way. Do you know what I mean? So do you think that was like... Um, but, but I mean that you said that's the utopia, I suppose, right? You, you want to you want to play that sort of possession football. I mean, what is what are the practical challenges of then trying to introduce that to like a, a club that's not in you know a lower league club, if you like? Yeah, so I think like everyone's um, vision of their team or style or beliefs of the football is really different. So I'm keen to stress that um, 
because I believe in something and I really enjoy doing something. It's not everyone's cup of tea at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I think a lot of people don't like it and tend to think it's, um, you know, we pass for the sake of it or it takes too long to get to the opposition goal. But the idea is that it's the most attacking way of football is to defend with the ball, to try and spend as, uh, as long a time as possible as f- with the ball as far away from our goal as possible. Um, and then, of course, like, you know, Max worked with uh, Matt Gill here, who's, who's my assistant manager, who's, who's outstanding and, and spent a lot of time with Max and that group coming through, Jamal Lewis, Todd Campwell, they had an excellent group. They were really good footballers, so they could dominate the ball at their level at the time um, just from being technically really proficient and really good and really athletic. When you go down the leagues, that's not... Um, it's why they're all playing at the top level now, but um, when you go down the leagues, obviously it's not always the case. They're, they Maybe they're really technically proficient but don't possess the athleticism they require to, to play higher. Some have unbelievable athleticism and maybe not the technical capability. So I think it's... Um, for us, it's always been about focusing on what people can do. How do we uh, highlight those strengths and get them to play to those strengths? How do we get them to specialise in one thing, at least, you know, to have a real super strength on the pitch, whether that's receiving behind the line, whether that's driving with the ball, whether that's um, passing through the line, whether that's, you know, defending properly. So there's lots of... Uh, there's lots of and I think you get caught in a trap as a coach or a manager of, of trying to focus or, or focusing on what people can't do. So we, um, we never try and do that. We focus on what they can do and really try and improve that and keep that as a real strength and try and then improve the other stuff whilst we're, we're making up for it almost by trying to highlight the super strength as much as possible. So I think it's about, I think the thing I've found over the last three seasons is about um, distances between players in and out of possession. I think um, the higher the level, I think there can be a, you know, there can be a bit more distance between players because they can execute things at real speed and and uh, with precision and detail. Um, and then and then when, when when you're working a bit lower down the league or whatever, there's some, it's just getting them to believe in it, really. But trying to, you know, make up for a mistake quickly if you can so the distance is closer together and make sure you can protect your goal if you lose the ball because you're trying to dominate it, all that stuff. So, But I think um, all of it comes down to just basically trying to manage um, them as people and encourage them to, to be really, really, well, not brave, because brave implies there's fear somewhere, but just to try and, yeah, get rid of that, the fear they've had. Because we've all been in environments where, you know, it starts at the start of a season or in a pre-season, we're going to play a bit and we're going to pass and then the first mistake happens and you get screamed at and shouted at and then the second one and then all of a sudden it's, you know, you're not doing that anymore. Um, so I think we just try and highlight constantly, analyse constantly what they're doing really, really well. And then the stuff are not doing so well, how we can help them, not like digging anyone out, but this is why we want you to do this and evidence in the why all the time and then show them how they maybe can do it and give them the options. And, you know, so it's like um, they have to live it in training. They have to live it all the time, try and make training as real- realistic as possible for them because um, by the time a Saturday comes, they should have done all the work and the training. I say to the players all the time, the training should be the painful bit. Should be a really hard bit. Interesting. And tell us about then, like, you know, for example, then that first, your first sessions or your first few sessions at MK, when you go in there, how do you sort of, you know, what, I'm always, because this is, you know, I'm a coach and this coaching podcast, I want to know, want to know details. What, what, what are you delivering? What, what do you go in there and say, right, I assume like well, you're changing style. I mean, what, what's, what's the first few sessions look like to try and, you know, I suppose, lay down the market to say, right, this is what you want. How are you basically going to try and get those results in that, in that short sort of time, if you like, yes. through your, for your sessions? I think it's priorities, isn't it? So we try to work in possession and out of possession on uh, different days. We still do that now. So the focus today, we had a training session was was out of possession. So it was, um, you know, pressing. If the press is broken, crushing space, getting back, um, and then defending the final third properly. So we're trying to link it all together. We split into units. We did the same at MK. So um, the first the first job I had at MK, I felt, was to change the mentality of the team out of possession and to work on the distances of the team out of possession. Um, so that was a real focus for us and saying, look, lads, this is going to be how we do it. This is going to be what we do. Um, and as long as we're trying to do the right thing and we're willing to run for each other, then, you know, when we, when we analyse the game, there's not going to be a problem. We're just might, we're going to have to improve things, of course, and we're going to have to work out what works for us and, and what we need to keep improving. But um, this is the, going to be the mentality of the team. So start off with a meeting before the session, this is why we're doing it. I think players want to understand the why. And then mm. if they understand why you're doing something, 
you know, there's a lot more, a lot more buying. And then when they get evidence of it working, even more buying, and then all of a sudden, um, you know, they start to generate a bit of belief in something and you can, whatever that is with us, it was about pressing really hard the pitch as much as we could and, and counter pressing when we lost the ball. Um, so the real focus on that in possession was just a couple of really simple points for us because it was never going to happen in one game, two games. I think we lost our first four games at MK. So, but every game you could see a gradual, gradual improvement. And that was about keeping people in position with structuring the team, um, making them understand why that's important. Not too many players running towards the ball all the time and, and playing in front of the opposition. Um, and then covering areas of the pitch that would allow us to give more time and space to the guys we were trying to build up. So there were just some really key, um, like fundamental things that you just keep building on, but that remain in place the whole time and just start building from there, really. Since you talk about there working on pressing first, out of possession, is because you're known as the, you know, the possession, you know, you're such a possession team manager, coach. Mm-hmm. And then it's interesting, you sort of counterintuitive, but as far as you know, it makes sense. And you get the ball back and then you keep it. But it's interesting, isn't it? And it, it, I'm just interested as well. I mean, you, you talk about those principles. I mean, what, what do you, what do you set? What do your early sessions look like in terms of you know, practice design? What did you know? What are you, you know, what what, what are you doing to get those messages across? Yeah, so we always try. We always try and um, like after the warm up, we go into something that's going to like lead in that makes sense, that's relevant to the session that we're doing. Usually on a smaller scale. So. Um, you know, it might be, we never try, we try not, we try and avoid anything generic really. So if, if I'm looking at um, tomorrow's session, we're doing an in possession session. The first bit after the warm up will be um, a defender plays to someone behind the line. He has to turn and drive. The defender chases him. So he has to take territory really quickly. He then has to try and hook the next defender. So it's a 2v2 really where his teammate is, is waiting on the line of that defender to drive forward, to drive beyond him. So it's about receiving the ball properly, quickly with your hips open, driving forward um, with purpose so the guy can't get back to you. And then the guy in front of you, your teammate having connection with him about, do you play inside the defender? Do you play outside? Working off the movement of the defender, what he does. Um, driving at him and pl- not playing until the very last second so you can take him out of the game totally. So his momentum is coming forward and yours is going the other way so you can drive past him. So um, all that stuff will be relevant to... So then what we're going into, then we're going into some final third, um, you know, we'll have like a, there'll be an unopposed practice for a team going on, we'll have it, we'll split them into three teams. The other two teams will go into, uh, again, build up, receive behind the line, drive forward, create an overload very quickly because the defender's going to come back in. So it'll be a 4v4, then it will turn into a four versus two once they broke the line. So relevant, and then we'll take that into a um, a bigger practice on a, on a, on a pitch size that is realistic. So we'll go into a final third wave game um, over like the final third of the pitch, really. So, um, yeah, which will focus again on build up. Once you broke that line, that's it. You're attacking and, and you go and score goals. So, and then it will go into 11 v 11 because we have some stuff we want to work on. So it's building it up. Um, and, and during that, they'll, get, they'll split up for in between the, the smaller possession game to the phase we'll do unit phases where I'll take the guys at the back for build up and we'll work on some goal kick routines because we we need to we got a bit stuck at the weekend um and uh, Gilly and, and the gang will take the guys at the top end of the pitch about exploiting gaps and, and making sure we always have runner on the top line and all those sort of stuff really fundamental so the session will link in it, the players will understand why I think well we'll talk to them about why at the start and by the end of it hopefully it'll make sense and we'll see some real good outcomes in the in the um, you know the match realistic situation at the end of it in the eleven eleven, you said like you resist generic stuff. So by that you mean sort of like boxes and things like that. Yeah, so if we do, do like, like rondo and stuff. If we do a rondo, it will have a theme to it and it'll be a point to it. Um, but like uh, you know, I remember doing seven v seven v seven on half a pitch and just chasing the ball relentlessly, and there was no real focus on the detail and and all that stuff. And, and there's a time and a place for it to, to run around, but I think with us we have to try and. Um, or all, all the time explain to the boys that this relates to how we play. What we're doing relates to how we play. So we're not just doing a 4v4 box. And even if we do, you know, how can we relate it to how, how we want to play? So it means we have to be quite creative with session design. Some work, some don't. But I think we've had three years now of working on stuff and we've got a big book of sessions that we like and we think works with the guys. Um, and I think also the players, and they, they, they understand that they're not... <laughs> 
They're not going to get let off with just um, run around and play football. I think maybe every now and again we have to, of course, they give us so much of for us and every now and again we have to give a bit of them time to enjoy what they do. So, you know, once every once in a while they'll have just some small-sided games, 4v4, 5v5 and a little tournament to give some competitiveness. But it's not very often. So then when they do get it, they're really at it and they really enjoy it and um, make sure it's worthwhile, really. Interesting. And it's a few sort of thinking, like in an average week, how much time do you spend in possession to out of possession? Um, so like our week works on a Monday. We'll analyse the game from the weekend. The guys who played will recover, so we'll take them out and do something. And 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 now I think um, we're in a good routine with that. They'll get they'll get some like even if it's a passenger, it'll be on the stuff that we feel maybe wasn't quite as clean as it should have been at the weekend. We'll try and make it relevant to their their position and unit specific. And then the guys who didn't play will do a very um, individual and unit specific session, and they'll come together at the end for some group work. Tuesdays is our uh, out of possession day. I work really hard. Wednesday is in possession. And, and if we've got a normal week on a Tuesday when we're working out of possession, we'll show the opposition in possession. So why we're doing some of the stuff we are in training and, and what went well on the weekend, we'll show them some more evidence of that. And we'll, and we'll flip it around on the Wednesdays. But um, I think we try and spend equal time with both really. Um, I think now we're in a really good place in terms of the lads understand exactly what we want on the pitch we, when we have the ball and what areas need to be occupied and, and how they can help each other out. And um, the same for our possession, we try and work on, you know, some different shapes and formations and how we can tweak it in games and manage games better now. But um, they all have a general, really good, really good understanding. But I think, and it is like the, we have to be, I say to them, you're, you know, if you dominate the ball, you have to press less. So you have to work really hard in possession. Um, but when we don't have it or when you lose it, the point is that we, we dominate the ball. We try and play close together so that you can win it back as quickly as possible. So we have to spend as much time on both, really. Otherwise, um, one without the other just never works, I don't think. I think you, and I think we've all been there and looked at teams and watched teams and played against teams and have been great on the ball, but um, you felt not quite, uh, not quite the same intensity here, out of possession. And I just don't want to be that. That, that team and I think the lads don't want to be that team so about striving to be really good at both and what about session design I'm interested in like you know when you first started how did you you know come up with sessions where you were just pulling on the experiences you've had in the past and tweaking obviously because you're trying to get very unique outcomes so these you know this how did that work and did you develop how did that develop yeah so that was again that was um we'd sit there as a coaching staff what's the priority, what do we want the team to look at? So like four really key points in possession, four key points out of possession to start with. It was, it was that was pretty um, straightforward. Uh, how do we get there? How do we need to condition the players to play this way. So physically we need a certain level of output. Deal with Matt Wilmot, who's here now with me at Swansea, who's with me at um, MK, who's brilliant. You know, what we're looking at, what do we need to, to look at physically, pitch size, dimensions, so that would all come into it. Um, and then the session design would go from there, really. And we'd always, we'd also always try and build up the session with um, warm up together, activation, leading session, we call it together. And that, that would be related to what we're doing, but that would be them together in the group. Then go away in their units and stuff and do their units and then bring it together again at the end. Um, and the session theme or the, the whole point of the session would be be um, consistent all the way through from the first session to the unit session to the end how it was going to look and then taking it onto the big pitch always to show the progression for them and how it relates to them on the big pitch now they've done it in a smaller area and um, so they can feel it and make mistakes and challenge and, and learn with each other like in match realistic situation really and, and what about because I know you have an individual coach there's stuff does stuff stuff individually how, does, how, 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 how much room is there at that level within that, you know, within the, the hectic week to develop individuals, you know, te technically, for example, or tactically? Yeah, a lot, a lot. I think um, we can always do more. I feel like we do a lot now with the guys. If you ask the players here, we spend a lot of time with them individually working on, and in their unit stuff, they're getting a lot of individual work. So uh, the guys at the back, you know, how they're going to receive the ball, how it can help them to get in a certain position. Um, we do a lot of um, stuff for their, like defenders for their footwork, being ready to defend, um, being clean with their action, with their footwork to give themselves an advantage straight away, all that sort of stuff. 
the strikers would do a lot of, um, you know, being in the middle of the goal, being off the shoulder of a centre half rather than playing against someone, and then and then running from there and finish. So number eight's receiving on one foot, on the back foot, being able to play quickly or drive forward and and change the direction of the play for us really quickly. So all that stuff we try and tie it all in so that. Um, it makes it easier for them on a Saturday, really. But yeah, I think we saw some massive gains with some players over the last three years at MK and here at Swansea, purely because of the amount of work that goes into them individually in the in the analysis suite and in the on the training pitch. And with a lot of the young guys, we spend a lot of time with them in the video room in the analysis suite to try and show them, you know, how what they're doing is working, how they're progressing, um, and just give them evidence and try and help them get find some solutions as well. So I think it's so important. The individual stuff is so important. And um, do they have like individual development plans or something like that? How do you yeah, they do? So Gilly, when Gilly came in, we, we, we sat down and discussed them. And Chris O'Leary's coming now from the 23s, and we were just going through four of the young boys there, their six week plan um, that the boys agree on about what they want to work on, what they want to improve. Um, we don't do it for everyone, you know, the guys over 30, we, we manage them and they help us with the younger guys and stuff. Um, but there's still stuff they, they can work on and improve. We don't formalise it like we, we, we do with the younger guys. Um, just because I feel like they don't need it. They understand what they need. They understand what their bodies need. They manage themselves really well physically. We try and manage them. Um, and they they uh, they get a lot of individual stuff in the unit stuff we do. But yeah, with the young guys in particular, and I think one of the reasons we were probably bought, um, we, were, we got this job in the end really was the, the fact that the, the, a lot of people saw a lot of young players improve at MK. And hopefully that's been the, been the case here, you know, with the like, likes of Flynn Downs and Joel Perot and um, Michael Abafemi. And all we're doing is trying to give them a platform to um, to showcase what they've got really and express themselves and, and just enjoy enjoy what they're doing. So what, what's your thoughts on that then, you know, with youth? I mean, obviously, you know, a lot, there's been a lot said in the past about players not getting opportunities. Is, is it a risk? Do you feel that it's a risk playing a young player because that lack of experience might make more mistakes and that impacts on you? Um, I don't think so. I mean, if you look at the team we had at MK and look at the team we've got here, I think they're both are really young. Um, I think we were the second youngest team in the championship last year on the whole. Um, uh, and I think um, what we did at MK is we we, we had Dean Lewington, we signed Richard Keogh, Andy Servan, Cameron Jerome, four unbelievable cultural architects experience that really help and add so much value to the younger lads and played a big part in helping us as coaches to develop them and talk to them and help them on the training pitch. We have that here in, you know, Carl Norton. We just signed Joe Allen, who's going to be fantastic with that. Grimes, he's not over 30. He's only 27, I think, but the way he leads and the way he helps young players is, is fantastic. So we, we have a bit of that here as well. And, and it's so important, I think. Um, for us, the way we want to play, it's like a, a double-edged sword, really. We have um, some incredible world of players with experience and understand and make good decisions. And um, But the young players come with uh, fearlessness, and, and and less scar tissue than some more experienced players, mm. less fear than some more experienced players who have you know been in the environment and and tried to play a certain way and found it difficult and um, then sort of maybe you know lost their place in the team and lost confidence and all that stuff which happens in football every everyone has the same um, but but you know often often footballers are just surviving they get to late twenties early thirties and just surviving your career rather than really really enjoying it it's always frustrated me and, and surprised me at the amount of players there are just doing what they have to do to just you know play another year or um stay in the team and 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 they move away from the football they played as kids and what they enjoyed doing and all that stuff and listen it's a career and, and it's work and you, you have to win and I completely understand all that but I find it quite sad that players you see someone at 16, 17, 18 have so much talent, so much play with so much freedom expression and people look at them go oh they're going to be brilliant and, but sometimes by the time they're 21, 22 they're out of the game or they're surviving somewhere in the lower league and scrapping and, and fighting and they've learned to do something else in their game which is fine but they've lost everything that made them unique and different and 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 special when they were kids and um, I think we just well, my view is like we try and get lads to do stuff that they would like to have done when they were kids like I dreamt of doing when I was a kid playing football and, and you know you get to a point in your career where you just you um you just survive and do what you need to do to make sure you're in the team every week. But hopefully we're trying to and I feel like the only way to really do that is by dominating the football. We're trying to get players to um really, really enjoy what they're doing and to try and express themselves and show the best version of themselves on the pitch, I think. 
do you think there's also like I imagine you know dealing with a young player probably easier to sort of mold and and maybe they don't have not cynicism but maybe I suppose you know if, if you're dealing with a more experienced player who hasn't been in, who's been in that environment maybe hasn't played the way you want them to play maybe they might they may, might be more cynicism there does that make sense is that you know maybe you're dealing yeah, with players with about, yeah, like, all that all that bag all their baggage they're taking there and then yeah, I suppose yeah. they'd be the they'd be the first one to say oh like you say you lost first four games oh this isn't working we've got to revert to you know what's you know, what yeah. we're doing best so yeah when you say cynicism and baggage that's that's what I call it just fear and scarce issue that yeah. they picked up from coaches in the game passing their own fear and ego onto them when they're kids and um, coming up for an academy and all that stuff and it's not all the time and then there's family pressure and all that stuff and your identity that you you just identify as a football player because that's the guy you've been for your friends as a kid your family the supporters that's how you've always been and then that becomes really scary the fact that you might lose that at some point so yeah there's loads of stuff that comes with senior players but to be honest, the ones we've had, like like I just mentioned already, um, they've been incredible with their willingness to take things on. We've had some players, and like MK early on, I felt like we had three groups of players, really. A group of players that um, really early on thought, just said, oh, that's too much for me. I, we can't play that way. It's like there was too much, you know, scar tissue, baggage, whatever you want to call it. There's a group of players who were quite interested but a little bit cynical is it going to work you know sitting on the fence a little bit could have gone either way and then we had a group of players one of them being Dean Lewington which really helped us because a lot of the players went away with him because he's been there so long and the captain we had a group of players just like yeah let's do this and a lot of them were the young guys because they realised actually we, we have a real chance to to look brilliant in this team if we, do, if we do it right and we dominate the ball a lot of them have gone on to better things now which is brilliant and um, some of them are back with us here um but we had three groups of players, really. And um, it was probably fairly similar when we came here to Swansea as well. We had a group who sort of early on went, probably try and get out of here quickly because this ain't going to be for me. And then we had a group. But the rest, it was less in that middle group. The rest were just like, yeah, all right, we'll take this on. We'll give it a go. We'll see. And then and then thankfully, you know, people like Matt Grimes, who, who signed a long-term contract, and Carl Norton, and these guys have um, just taken on brilliant. They've been massive drivers for us in terms of how we behave and how we train and, and just the rest of the guys sort of went, went with them really. It's been, it's like a bit of a, been a bit of a cultural shift anyway. It, I mean, not only at the top level, but English football, in, even in the lower leagues, more people are trying to play a bit. I mean, I've been lucky enough to spend some time with Kevin Betsy and Dan Machici at Crawley recently, just stuff. They're trying to, you know, impose a similar, you know, very possession-based style. Do you think that, do you think there's, there's more people doing it and, you know, less people sort of, you know, saying what's, what's going on there sort of thing? Yeah, I think um, there's no, again, there's no right or wrong way, right? So um, right. what some people believe in and, and have been really successful in is very, very different to what I like my team to do or the or my players to do. And there's always going to be a contrast of stars. Like you have to have the yin and the yang, right? You have to have some balance. Right. I think culturally, this style of play in um, is less accepted in British football as the, as the norm as it would be elsewhere. And it's almost like... Um, frowned upon at times because it's not I guess like that you have to put football in cultural context and different clubs in like we're really lucky that we had MK Dons where it had created you know going back to sort of Carl Robinson and when, when Pete gained the job you know possession based football and Pete was not one of these clubs to be known for that and it, and it did it got an identity and then lost its way a little bit we were asked to bring it back and then we came here where um, over the years, you know, Roberto Martinez and Brendan Rodgers and all those guys, culturally, it fits the club and it suits the club. And, and thankfully for us, it does. And, and we're here trying to bring our own version of it now. But, you know, I'm well aware that our style of um, football, or whatever you want to call it, or the way we do things, is not going to be a cultural fit for a lot of clubs. I'm totally aware of that. Like, you know, it, where people expect a certain... Um, the team will reflect what the what the supporters want and some people just want which is traditionally the british way of doing it if you look at like german football it's very much transitional counter attack press vertical football like um is the culture of german football spanish football is very much you know dominate the football possession based um patient purpose italian football based on defensive structure being really organized and a bit of a mix of the both, really, like in terms of, you know, possession based. And um, so there's always cultural context in British football. The culture on the whole and, and over the years has been traditionally is like, roll your sleeves up, work really hard, outfight people, outrun people, 
get the ball wide, cross the ball in the box, the old big man, little man up front. Like that was the culture for so long. And there's no, again, there's no right or wrong way. But then, you know, people, we've been really lucky to have some top, top um, foreign coaches come over and show show different ways of doing it. Like, you know, the two best at the moment, Klopp and Guardiola, are very, very different. They have very different beliefs, I'm pretty sure. Um, when you watch their teams, there's definitely different uh, beliefs, but they're both incredible what they do tactically the way they manage the you know the the emotional intelligence the way they manage people is fantastic and I think we've been really lucky to sort of um and I was really fortunate to play against some teams and, and internationally and in the Premier League where I picked up some stuff when I was playing that I thought that's really hard to play against I really like that I'm gonna have a closer look at that and we're really lucky now that we're at an age where you can literally access anything on the internet and and, and be curious and go and learn other stuff and so yeah I think People broaden their horizons a little bit. People want to want to have a, a look outside the box and see what will work for them and, and bring their own version of it. And I think slowly but surely, the, the supporters and of clubs and, and and in British football in general is slowly becoming more open to to, to other ideas. I think and um, yeah, I think you're always going to have a mixture and a balance. Like I said, there's no right or wrong way, but I think it's nice to have a nice to have some different um different opinions and different ideas and, and people trying things and you know like kevin and dan there just being brave to do what they want to do i think traditionally again managers get the first job all of a sudden it's the fear of losing that job not getting another job if it doesn't go well and the amount of coaches and managers i spoke to on my coaching courses and and uh, when i got the job and they were just like you know stick to what you believe in regardless because they made that mistake and you know, they regret it ever since they didn't stick to what they believed and got caught up in the fear and just, you know, game to game trying to save their job. So, um, yeah, I think that's been really easy for me because we really believe in something so strongly that we have a plan and, and process and we stick to that and we're quite consistent with that. And um, we have to tweak it and improve it all the time, but we don't get drawn into, uh, yeah, that game to game stuff that, you know, that, that driven by fear because it's just not productive, I don't think. Can I just read you this? It's the Sunday talk of the internet. So just uh, it says, uh, uh, March 2021, Martin Side scored after a 56-pass move, a new British record at the time. At a culmination of 21 season, only Man, United, Man City and Barcelona had a higher average possession percentage in Europe than Martin's MK Dons. I mean, that's just like, I'm just coming off that, that's a bit astounding, isn't it? I mean, what's, what's I mean, does, does that fill you with pride? Is that just one of the outcomes that comes through? Um, I mean, that's pretty, you know... Yeah, I think I, like, I really enjoyed the goal. <laughs> Not many people did. I think they mm -hmm. put it on social media and got loads of the comments about boring and could have cost it 12 <laughs> passes and that stuff. But like Gillingham kicked the ball out from kickoff or a throw in, then the next time he touched the ball was in the back of the net. It was lovely. It was like three and a half, four minutes of like for us, brilliant football and all the stuff we'd worked on so hard in training. So for, for us to show that clip to the players was just fantastic and then someone said it was you know a record goal and the club wanted to make a big thing out of that which was great for them I think what made me more grateful and um what gave me more enjoyment was just watching how the young some of the young lads in particular in that game how much they'd grown and how willing they were to take things on you know it was, it was, it was really yeah really fantastic and I, I loved I loved watching them and I was really grateful to watch that but we lost that game we finished 13th in the league so um, that would be the criticism, I guess, when people go, OK, yeah, all that possession, all that nice football and the goal and all that stuff. But um, we finished 13th, but it was a real, for us, a real work in progress. And we improved a lot as the season went on. We got much harder to play against, conceded less goals, scored more goals, finished the second half of the season really strongly and felt we were really building something, some really strong foundations, which is why then we were able to go and sign, you know, Scott Twine, Troy Parrott, all these guys, because we played a... A style of football that people really wanted to be part of. Um, I think we've been fortunate here that that sort of followed us here and we have a lot of players that have joined us here that could have gone and got more money elsewhere and stuff, but they really want to be part of um, playing in this way and we're quite intrigued by it. I think, you know, and that's why Joe Allen's come back as well. It's obviously his club, but he had a lot of offers and he was just really, really um, wanting to come back and play for, for Swansea and what he saw as the as the Swansea way, and, and which is the way that we play. So, yeah, um, we, I think we've... We really enjoy it, mate. It's, you know, we had a tough first season last year. Again, we knew it was going to be lame. Found that, I think the point is to play this way, it takes time and it's not overnight and it's going to be painful. You just have to be willing to go through that pain to get where you want to get to. Um, you know, we could set the team up. It'd be, a bit, it'd be a quicker fix, I think, to set the team up to defend and counter-attack and all that stuff. But one, we don't believe in it. Um, 
and two, it's not why we got the job here. So, uh, yeah, we have to be authentic to ourselves and what we want, really. What would your advice be to like a youth coach like, or someone who works in development? I mean, I'm in, I work in youth development, so I can afford to be an idealist. Yeah. And I think like the modern game is the way about it's possession football and building out from the back. And it's, that's the best way to develop young players. That's my opinion, obviously. Maybe I'm biased because I've worked at big clubs and you know, try and develop Champions League players in the better commas. But, but what would you, you know, what would your advice be to, uh, you know, a, a youth coach who's trying to develop teams to then, you know, not when you want to develop individual, develop those teams. How, how, what are the principles to try and basically get players to dominate the ball so much? And you know, what, what are these, what are the key things you're telling your your, co- your players, your coaching staff to say, right, this is what's, this is going to help us develop. Just you know, if it, if it's not necessarily just the practices, what is it that's helping you do yeah. that? And then what what's the information you can share with the, all the young coaches around the world? So um, yeah, my, mine would be um, I think ball mastery. So being able to receive on both feet, being able to pass off both feet, being able to receive in tight areas and, and, and manipulate the ball, being aware of what's around you. So like all that stuff should, is like taken as a given, but so many players at first team level can't do it. Mm. So you almost have to go back to like square one and this is your body shape when you receive. So if they can't do that by a certain age, then you're not, you're, you're not, you're not doing your job really. Like you have to, step back and put your ego to one side you want to do this really fancy session but make them master the ball first and like I, I really don't like um, pigeonholing players into positions until they get older as well so like I watch eight nine year olds now and like yeah he's a centre half why is that because he's big how, how do you know, how, how big is he going to be when he's older how do you know that like yeah you can predict it and all that stuff but um, just make them again like if they can't manipulate the ball and, and control the ball and pass the ball and um, understand the message they're putting on the ball, the detail they're giving their teammate and all that stuff, like non-verbal communication, why are you passing the ball there? Where do you want to put the ball there? Why do you want your teammate to do that? All that stuff, like having an understanding with the ball, then you just need to create a really good athlete, really. And a lot of, some people get through on being really good athletes, but the point is if you can run and do that, you have a really big chance of becoming a football yeah. player, right? So, and if you can't run, you need to be exceptional at that. So let's try it. Like I said that when we've had a meeting here at the academy and Swans have been unbelievable at creating players over the years. But, um, you know, we need to keep doing that and you need to create exceptional footballers. And and because there was a, some people saying, you know, well, the Swansea thing, over the, we get labelled as creating nice footballers that can't do the ugly side of the game and all that stuff. And it's like, well, no, that comes into it a little bit later. Like teach them to be really, really good footballers, coach them to be really good footballers. But that means for the coach putting their ego away a little bit um, and, and sometimes not doing the stuff, you know, the shape stuff and trying to win games. And what I really feel, naively or not, and some people really disagree with me, that it ain't about winning in academy football until, they, until they're much older. It's not. It's about, it's a process of, right, what went well today? What were we looking for from the players? Did they do this? Did they do that? What do we need to do better? Let's see that get better in the next game. You can't coach everything all the time. So did that improve? Yeah. What Can we improve it more? Yes, we can. How do we do that? So the process should just stick with that all the way through. So, But I understand that if you're an under-10s coach and you want to become the under-12s coach, you want to win games, you want your team to perform really well. But fundamentally, if you give the players in a year's time or two years' time to the next coach and they're really proficient, they have a really good attitude towards learning and training, culturally that the group is strong they can all play football receive the ball properly they can kick with both feet then that next coach or someone is going to recognize oh they've done a really good job yeah they got beat 25 games out of 30 or whatever but they've done a really good job because we've got 10 players here who've got a really big chance of progressing do you know what i mean yeah so yeah, two yeah. Many coaches in my view and my experience are like in a rush to become first team coach, first team manager. And it's, it's, people say it's easy for me to say I've become a manager. But like that was years of um, coaching badges whilst I was playing, studying football, speaking to people, building connections, going to watch teams train, watch rugby teams train, to have a look at the coach, all that stuff. So, and someone, people knew that, which is why I got the opportunity I did. But I was willing to go right back in and start wherever I needed to. I was coaching at my academy in Brighton, under eights, under nines, under tens, working out what was really important that I gave them at that point. And I believe it was hopefully some technical proficiency and understanding of why they're doing certain things. 
Um, at Norwich, I helped out with a few of the younger age groups. I helped Gilly with the 23s for six months when I was out of the squad there, training with them every day. Great learning experience. And it's like, um, just don't be in a rush. If you're really good, you'll be really, you'll be, it will be noticed. And, yeah, I, and think, like, I think the problem is uh, something like the rest of us uh, is that obviously sometimes it comes from the club as well. So, you know, you, you're, yeah. in a very, you're, you're in a very unique position if you're in an academy and the club's boss is saying, you, yeah, results don't matter. I mean, I've, you know, I've worked at a few and... Yeah, but we're, I know we're in an academy, so it's broken, so, so like... It's, yeah, um, I agree, mate. And the I, players that go through it and make it, so it can't just be about winning, can it? Like, what, yeah, I agree, mate. How many players are making I, it from them teams that win? Yeah, but I think it's a cultural thing, though, isn't it? We talked about culture earlier. It's the Sims, still culture in the academies. The problem is people judge, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll try and measure success in terms of what the game looks like on the Sunday on a Saturday, even like, so if you're nines and the tens and they, you know, this is cliche, you're looking at a nice, pretty game of football, one touch and actually, you know, this, you want the reverse, you want a bit of a messy game of football, you want people making mistakes and that sort of thing, stuff we talk about on the show all the time, but I still think there's a cultural shift, a lot of academies will be, you know, and I've worked at academies, you know, some of the biggest in the world, so no, we want to win, you know, you talk about nines and tens, you know, it's, and then and that's a problem yeah, still no, within we're talking the system. About, we're, talking about, we're talking about the same thing, so at nine or ten years old, you're passing on your own ego or the academy exactly. manager's ego and fear. So, like, you just have to win, lads. Just do yeah. it. And at some point, I get it, it's about winning and that sort of has to come into it, but it ain't that early, in yeah. my opinion. Oh, exactly, yeah. And, but I look at kids who, who um, go through the academy system. They've spent eight years playing football from eight to 16. They get released at 16, hate football, and never play again. That's not right. Mm. Yeah. And then they do two, or, they, or they're lucky enough to get a two-year scholarship and then they get released at 18 and don't play football again. It's not right. Then they're lucky enough to get a first year pro or whatever. Some of them, 18, 20, play 23s football for a year or two, get released, don't quite make it. They fill the squad for a year, train with the first team a little bit, had an experience of it. Then go to um, non-league or lower league club struggle, drop out the game within a few years. Like it's, You've seen it, how many times you've seen it happen? You've seen so many good young players and yeah. like, I've played players who are better than me. Every player in here has probably played with a player who was better than them at some point. So what what has gone wrong? It's like they've been they've been let down somewhere or they've let themselves down. But a lot of the time it's a bit of both. But we have to accept that as like I think for us it's like we work, we try and we try and help every player. If we can't get them to the point where they're going to play for us or be good enough, we deem them not good enough because football is about opinions. It's not for lack of trying. I feel like we give up on players and stop trying in general as a whole far too early and far too easily because there's so many players out there. And like when the culture is just about winning, well, if we don't win, what do we do? Well, we're going to get better players. Why have you taken them players on now at this point then? Like if you only really want a certain type of player, only take on four and don't play games. Put them up a year, put them down, do whatever you want. Otherwise, you're just taking on numbers. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It frustrates me because the... Academy culture in general, and it's because no one stands up in front of parents and says, Look, this ain't about winning. If you're about winning, go to the other club. This is about developing and creating players. Yeah. When your son, your in women's football, hopefully growing that way as well, giving your son and daughter a chance to become the best player they possibly can, hopefully for this football club, if not someone else. And the only way we believe of doing this is to create this kind of player and this is going to take years. And guess what? If we do this now and have three or four years of pain, by the end of it, they're probably going to win a lot and enjoy it a lot. But you have to be willing to go through some pain, especially with kids. It's so up and down what they what go about, through. The what, what about, like, you talked a little bit early, you, know, you talked earlier about individual development plans. Because your, your story is quite inspiring as well in terms of you worked your way up from the O-Leagues into the Premier League. Uh, how much room do you think there's developed? Because I'm, I'm lucky I work individually. I work individually with Premier League players and championship players. And like you say, some of the players can't strike the ball properly on the weak side or open up on the weak side properly. And they're playing at the highest level. I mean, mm. how much how much room for improvement is there, at, you know, for, for established pros to keep going and keep improving and being technically better? Oh, unbelievable. Yeah, I think just repetition, mate. Repetition, repetition, repetition. And... Um, creating time for themselves and coaches finding time for them to to keep doing it. To keep, we like we drilled down on so many basics last year, especially with like I focused a lot on defenders, Gilly, um, a lot on the attacking players, um, Luke when he was here on the midfielders, like really simple basic skills that we felt would really help them come on a Saturday, like to be able to do that. Repeat that action quicker. So what? So that's the best sort of stuff we're doing with the defenders. Then what sort of so like defenders? You know, defenders, 
like resetting into their position, keeping their shoulders open, receiving it on the back foot, taking their touch and putting the ball um, where they wanted it so they could have any pass on the pitch after that. Because so if what, they didn't so what would up, what would, what that practice look like then in, in effect is just working with a player in isolation, zipping it in, opening yeah, it up. Yeah, so in isolation, so like I would be a guy pressing them. They would run with intensity to keep the shoulder <laughs> open, to to put me off the press a little bit because if they can face forward by the time I'm getting there, then I'm in trouble. So being able to do their work really early to receive the ball with their shoulders open, something really simple like that. And then we just showed them relentlessly in training. Look what you did here. This made the game so much easier for you and your teammates. Mm -hmm. the intensity to receive and then put in the touch where you needed it to because you've done the work early. So just really basic stuff like that, but repeated it relentlessly after training, 10, 15 minutes. Then again, the next day on the other side of the pitch. So by the end of it, we saw some real improvements in, in certain, certain players that really helped their performance, which meant it helped us as a team. So, so when you're... I don't think you can ever stop improving. Like yeah. you can ask Dean Lewinson, who was 37, I think, when we took over... Um, we've done loads of work with Dino on certain bits and he played in a totally different position. He'd been left back all his career, played left centre half for us. By the end of the season, he had the most final third passes in the country, the most forward passes because he'd done, he realised because of his age and, and how important putting himself in the right position to receive the ball. And obviously he has a great understanding anyway, he's played so long, but all of that, um, he, he was fantastic. One of our best players and he improved so much at 37. It was incredible. So, you have to, you know, when they talk about players, talk about doing extras and stuff. You're a big fan of that? Players want to do more or is it all tied in with yeah, anyway, yeah. within your sessions? 100%. We try and do as much as we can in the session, but you can never tap. That's the point, like I just said about like academy. You can never do everything. So, yeah. um, focus on something. And then, you know, a lot of the players now will, will take their own. Um, we do a lot of unit meetings together. Players sometimes take them. Um, but, yeah, players at the end of the session will do... Uh, we'll, we'll, we have a good culture here in terms of they stay out. And they practice stuff that's specific as well. You know, like, used to stay out and practice a shooting from the edge of the box and take a touch and slow and then drill the ball in. Mm. Um, just unrealistic. So, again, if we're doing individual stuff, we try and make it as re realistic as possible stuff that's going to help them in their position on the pitch on, on a Saturday. Yeah, interesting. And, and Mr. in terms of recruitment, when you're out there looking for players, what sort of things are you looking for? Technically, tactically, psychologically, all those sort of areas. Yeah, psychologically, character, mate. Um, courage to play. Um, it's really difficult sometimes when you you play this way and you're watching players in team in teams that don't particularly play that way. So you're then you're looking for a couple of moments, you know, a couple of moments of composure, a couple of moments of detail, um, and then you think, okay, yeah, he can do this if we give him a bit more of a license to to play and stuff. So I think mean, with like the technical component, tactical is difficult. Cause it's, as I said, it's quite different to some teams. Um, but the technical component is really, you know, simple. Can he can he pass the ball in a, in a way that would <laughs> suit us? With um, can he pass the ball with precision over a distance and at speed? You know, with ball speed, can he keep the ball speed high? Does he control the ball and give himself a chance to to do what he needs to do with it? Uh, does he show enough composure? And and also like we have a few key points in in every position, really, like specialists. We talk about specialists in certain positions. So if you're playing a number, as a number eight for us, we call it, you need to be able to receive behind the line, take it in, in one action with your hips and shoulders open and drive forward straight away. It's really important. So like when we signed Jamie Patterson last summer, we looked at him for thought he can definitely do that. Um, he, and then we put him in a position where we thought would really suit his skill set. He played a lot of his career out wide. We brought him inside and played him behind the lines and he had... He had his most successful season he's had in terms of goals and assists, and he was fantastic for us for, for long periods. Um, and I think that's because we recognised he had a certain skill set and we tried to put him in a position that really um, would highlight that skill set. And then he had the courage and the willingness and the, the tactical understanding to go and carry it out, which was, was, was brilliant for us. Um, and we got him on a free transfer. So, yeah, there's, I think character first. We need to be able to see that they're brave enough to try and, and play and and uh, put their foot on the ball and, and make good decisions. And then after that, it's about the technical capability. And then, of course, the physical is like um, we have a certain, we require certain amounts of athleticism in certain areas and others less so. So it depends on the position on the pitch. Um, I would say on the outside of the pitch, we need some real athleticism inside. It's about being technical and, and proficient, and, but 
also are they willing to run when we're out of possession because of the way we want to play. And what about yourself? What would you say that the main things that you've improved on as a coach or in the last few years have been? What was what are the main things you've developed, do you think? Um, I think um, just develop more clarity in what, in what we want, um, how we how we communicate to the players. Um, I think uh, try and be try, I try I try and be myself. We try, I think we are we try and be ourselves as much as we can with the players. So we're quite um, quite close to the players, I guess. Quite open, quite warm. Um, but I feel like we we're still firm enough to you know make sure that what we get. There's certain standards and certain, you know, I'm really proud of the culture we created at MK and I'm really proud of the culture we've created here because I think it's one where people are able to be themselves. They work really, really hard when we're working. When we're not working, they have fun and they enjoy themselves. And I think that's been the biggest thing for me is like um, try and make people feel connected to the purpose of the team, the vision of the team. Um, and then all of a sudden it becomes much easier. I feel like on the training pitch, just having... Just having hours on the grass, mate, is, uh, has improved me as a coach for sure. Um, spending hours with the players in the video suite and and analysing yourself, like we as a group of coaches, Gilly and me and, and Chris and Matty Wilmot and Ben, the analyst, and we'll all be in here. Andy, obviously, you spoke to Andy before. Andy Parslow now is a set piece coach, yeah. trying to add a skill set. I don't particularly enjoy doing set pieces. We didn't have a great record last year, so he does. He's great at it. We brought him in because, we could, again, it's about adding, strengthening our own weaknesses and and, and not, no, noticing our own blind spots. And it's because we talk a lot. We analyse training. We analyse how we've delivered it. We'll talk about what didn't work, what did work. So it's just a lot of feedback all the time, mate. We review ourselves and the players a lot and then try and try and uh, improve what we're doing. So we like, I always say, we you know, we, we plan. We practice, we perform, and then we analyse, and then we plan again off the back of that analysis, and it just repeats that you know that process of trying to get better and and then just um, enjoy it whilst we're doing it. Do you, do you also like watch you know other coach? You talk about Guardiola and Klopp. Do you watch football at the highest level and take things from there and ideas, and you know we'll see you know yeah, yeah, love, patterns and love, stuff like that. Yeah, we love to, and we've all got. Um, like favourite teams, they're all different, really. So, like Chris is a, a huge Celtic fan. I really enjoyed watching um, what Postacoglu done with them last season. So, and I had the best, like you know, I, I worked with Matt O'Reilly who signed there, Jamie. So, I really wanted, I was yeah. keen to see how he got on, and so I enjoyed watching them. They were good. Um, I love watching Man City. Uh, you know, I, I love watching the Spain national team um, when I get a chance. Um, so, if them teams are playing, we'll watch them. You know, Gilly really, really enjoys watching City, Liverpool. So um, yeah, I think I'm re we're really uh, I try and get a bit of balance as well, switch off sometimes. But when you know there's a team plan that you really enjoy watching, you think you can maybe take some stuff off. And we always look um, the analysts as well here; they're brilliant because they understand what we want, what we need. The analysis team is great. So if we've missed something from a big game that they feel is really relevant to us, or a a game, not a big game, Premier League game, German game, whatever it is, and they feel it's relevant, then They'll look at it and they give us um, like a statistical database of teams we're really similar to in terms of performance data. So then we'll go and watch them. What are they doing that's similar to us? What are they doing that's different? How can we take that and make it ours? How can we tweak our own thing? Would that improve us? All that stuff. So we're really fortunate. We have a, we have a really good group of staff here that are always trying to um, find solutions to the next problem, really, because there's always going to be, we're always going to have to keep up and keep moving forward. And what would your advice be to a young coach who wants to get out and be a you know assistant coach, head coach if you like, and have a career in a game like yourself? Spend as many hours on the grass as you can. Um, spend as many hours as you do on the grass reviewing yourself and analysing the sessions. And we'll start, I think, be really clear in um, not, listen, tactics and all that will change. If you're an assistant manager working with a manager, and then you go and work with a different manager, the requirements will be different, but be really clear in how you want to be. So how you're going to behave with the players, how you're going to communicate with the players, how you are going to be with your energy, your body language during a session, what you're comfortable with, um, work out what you're not comfortable with and, and, and do it loads. So you become comfortable with it in terms of delivering, whether it's planning a session you're not sure about, um, the numbers change in the session, all that stuff. So I just think... Get loads of experience as much as you can with different groups, different age groups, 
um, and just work out what you are going to be, where your strengths lie and where your weaknesses are. And can you feel those weaknesses or is that going to be a weakness for you? Because, you know, some I've got mates who are really good coaches, but they never had a playing career. So for them, they're like, that's always going to be a weakness for me. So I need to make up for that. I can't do anything about that. I've never played. So I'll make up for that in another way by being being able to, um, you know, code with the analysis. I can not only coach really well, but I can do the analysis well. I can clip up on the analysis stuff for, for, for the manager and all that stuff. And people, I know people who've got jobs off the back of that. They can do both really, really well. Um, but I just think be the best at what you're trying, be the best version of yourself, whatever you're going to be. And that, that, that is simple. If you are really good at developing young players and you love working with young players, like, you know, 10, 12, 14, whatever, just be really, really brilliant at that. Like, there's no, yeah, there's go on. Like, there's not enough yeah. here. There's not enough. I know academy coaches don't get paid as much as first thing that but it's such an important job. And it's, it's such a valuable job and having relationships with those kids and those families and seeing them go on and develop and have careers that I do. Like you must get a bit of that now working with individuals and then you go and see them doing well. Yeah. The feeling of that, the fulfillment you must get from that is, you know, so worthwhile. So I just think, yeah, be, be the best version of yourself and work, work out what you're going to, um, going to be, be really good at. And last question is a little bit different because normally I would say any advice for a young player, but any advice just for a pro player? Because obviously, you know, the career where you worked your way up, you played in the Premier League and you've gone on to coach and you're coaching at the highest level. What would your advice be to a pro player in terms of, you know, to try and remind them, maybe like you said, not to lose that inner sort of child or that inner belief of that fun and to still have that aspiration to try and play at the highest level? I think, yeah, I think you're always capable of more. Always capable of more. And I think um, be yourself. Be fearless because when you look at it really like it's a game we've all loved it since we were kids i know there's a lot of pressure put on it all the social media and all that stuff but it really is just noise it's irrelevant like you're not just a football player uh, to many you are obviously but you're not just that so why would you be limited by that to just survive in the game try and enjoy it as much as you can i look back on my and like when i first got to premier league i've done everything i worked so hard in the gym all this stuff eight so religious, so strict, trained harder than anyone else. It's part of the reason it got me there. But I played my best football when I let go of all that and just went, you know what, I've done everything I can during the week to prepare. And then on a Saturday, I have no control, really. I'm going to go out there and play as well as I possibly can. If I don't play well, I'll analyse it and have a look why, see what I can improve. But it's not the, um, it's not the end of the world. I'll be all right. Do you know what I mean? We'll go again. And uh, if I'm taking out the team, another opportunity will arise at some point. So it's just letting go of that. Like they have, the only things you can control is turning up, be present every day, um, and, and and that is it. Russell Martin, thanks very much, mate. It's been top. No problem.